I'm a Congresswoman Lucille Royball Allard, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to the 40th Congressional District and to today's forum, When Women Succeed, America Succeeds. I extend a very warm thank you to uh, the City of Commerce and their wonderful staff for hosting us for this very exciting event. With us this morning is the Mayor Pro Tem for the City of Commerce, Lilia R. Leon, whom I'm going to ask to, to come up just to say a few words. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us this morning, and welcome to the beautiful City of Commerce. On behalf of the entire City Council, and especially our new elect Mayor, uh, Mayor Tina Baca Del Rio, couldn't be with us today. Can you hear me? Yes? yes. Okay, good. I want to make sure everyone hears me. She couldn't be here with us tonight, but to this morning, but she sends her regards and welcomes you to the beautiful city of Commerce. With us tonight, or this morning, I keep saying tonight because we're having a big event tonight, is uh, one of our council members, Denise Robles, is in. Uh, thank you. And also another a council member in the back, Mr. Ca um, council member Ivan Altimirano. Thank you for joining us. And uh, Council Member Joe Aguilar couldn't be here with, uh, with us this morning. But I just want to take a brief, I have notes, but you know, sometimes <coughs> it's better just to speak from your heart. I am so, so honored to have, look at these young, I mean, the, I'm saying young because young women, <laughs> young women with us today, they were the forefront of many, um, uh, many of us who are now elected officials. They were able to, you know, be the trailblazers and, and open the doors for many, many women. And those in the audience that are even just a hint of thinking of representing your city, please do so. Whether it's by volunteering, because that's how I started with the Junior Chamber of Commerce. Yes, volunteering, yes. <laughs> You know, it opens up the doors to know people. And then I went on and became a commissioner. So please, there's a lot of commissioners here also. Yes, commissioners. I think that, that volunteering helps you grow. And at the same time, you help your community. So please do so. I won't take any more of your time. Welcome to the beautiful city of Commerce. I hope that you have an opportunity to drive around and, of course, shop at our beautiful Citadel, which, by the way, our Congresswoman is her uh, home there at the city, uh, uh, at the Citadel. So thank you. Her, her, her congressional office, not her home. Let me rephrase that. I don't want to be misquoted, but thank you for being in our city, Congresswoman. We really appreciate it, and thank you so much. I'm going to say young ladies again because look at how beautiful you are. Thank you so much, and enjoy the day. pleasure to join my colleague, Congresswoman Janice Hahn, and Congresswoman Grace Napolitano, who will be here a little bit later, in co-hosting today's event in support of the When Women Succeed, America Succeeds Democratic Economic Agenda. Today, nearly half of all workers in America are women, and 40% of working women are the primary breadwinners in their families. Yet the poverty rate among women in our country is over 16 percent, the highest poverty rate for women in 17 years. While it is true women have fought hard to open doors of opportunity in the workplace and have successfully entered professions once solely the domain of men, it is also true that working women make up two-thirds of our country's minimum wage workers and on average receive only 77 cents for every dollar paid our male counterparts. Equally as appalling is that women systematically are paid less than men when doing the exact same work. These realities are unfair and simply unacceptable. Equally unacceptable 
is the fact that wage disparities are even greater for women of color. Black women working full time in California are paid just 64 cents and Latino women just 55 cents for every dollar paid white men. The impact of these disparities is devastating to these women's economic stability, both present and future. As an example, let's take the average annual earnings for Latinas, which is $19,000 less than the medium annual income for white men. This annual loss of $19,000 means that every year Latinas in Los Angeles lose the equivalent of nearly two years of childcare or two years of groceries or nearly one year of rent. It also means they will get lower unemployment benefits if they lose their job and lower social security benefits when they become seniors. Some experts predict that it will take another 45 years before women's earnings reach parity with men's, and that it will take even longer for black and Latina women whose median age, uh, wages increase more slowly than women overall. America's women and their families cannot afford to wait nearly half a century to reach wage parity and receive equal pay for equal work. The When Women Succeed, America Succeeds agenda is a response to the severe financial pressures women face in our country today. It is an agenda that will enable women to achieve greater economic security by raising their wages and giving them the opportunity to meet their career and family obligations through such things as paid medical and family leave. It is also an agenda that taps into the strength and talents of women and recognizes that the economic success of our country depends upon empowering working women to achieve greater economic security for themselves and their families. In other words, and you can join me, when women succeed, America succeeds. I didn't hear you. One more time. When women succeed, America succeeds. Now, before I introduce uh, our next speaker, I want to remind you that you can tweet about this event using hashtag women succeed. In Espanol, as hashtag Mujeres Exitosas. <coughs> it is now my honor to uh, introduce my co-host and an outstanding member of Congress, Congresswoman Janice Hahn. Yeah. I'm not finished yet. I'm not finished yet. Okay. In the short time Congresswoman Hahn has been in Congress, she is already a respected member of the House who is known for her hard work and effective advocacy on behalf of the residents of her 44th Congressional District. Janice is co-chair and founder of the Ports Caucus and the co-chair of the California High Speed Rail Caucus, two very important issues for our communities. She is also a member of the House Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure. Her subcommittees include Coast Guard and Marit uh, Maritime Transportation, Highways and Transit, Water Resource as and Environment, Railroads, Pipelines, and Hazardous Material. Mm. She is also a member of the House Committee on Small Business and the ranking member of the sp Subcommittee of Health and Technology. She is a great and valuable asset to Congress, and I'm proud to have her not only as a colleague, but as a friend. Please give her another warm welcome.
Thank you so much uh, for that great introduction. Uh, and I'm so pleased to be here uh, today. And thank you to uh, the Mayor Pro Tem, Leon, for uh, gracing us with your presence and your welcoming, and to the members of the council here in the City of Commerce. This is a beautiful city. This is a beautiful uh, dais and chambers. Uh, it's really a, a, a great place to govern uh, this, this city from. And thank you to Lucille Royball Allard, a good friend of mine and really one of the women, as you talked about, who really is a trailblazer and has opened the doors for so many uh, women to follow in her footsteps. Interesting to note, for those of you who don't know, Lucille and my are dads some gosh, I want to say 60 years ago, served together on the Los Angeles City Council. Uh, so they were colleagues on the Los Angeles City Council. And to think this many years later, the next generation, the women uh, went to Congress. <laughs> I know. So thank you all for uh, spending your Saturday morning with us. I know uh, every woman I know is busy and probably has a lot of uh, to-do things on their list for a Saturday. So I appreciate the fact that you uh, are here. Uh, you could have been spending the morning with your family, your friends, uh, but we really love it that you came out here today. And I know many of you work two jobs or, or put in extra shifts to make ends meet. Uh, and I know what a luxury it is maybe to, to have just taken Saturday morning and done something for yourself. Uh, but hopefully what you're doing here today will be for yourself and it will be for uh, other women in this country. Thank you for being here. Uh, and as my colleague said, for the first time in history, half of the U.S. workers are women. Additionally, women are either the primary breadwinner or the co-provider for nearly two-thirds of our American families. Our country is radically different uh, than it was when our dads served uh, in the Los Angeles City Council. But our policies and our economic institutions are lagging far behind our reality. Today, women across the country are facing unprecedented economic insecurities. Right now, 42 million women and 28 million children who rely on them are living in poverty or are on the brink of poverty. Too many of you in this room know what it means to live paycheck to paycheck and not to have the flexibility at work to care for your family. I recently met with former First Lady of California, Maria Shriver, a longtime champion of these issues. And she recently published the Shriver Report, which details extensively the lives of women who are living on the brink of poverty. And during her visit uh, to Washington, D.C., we talked about the immensity of this problem and the comprehensive solutions to help our women and our families. And we need to elevate these issues into the national dialogue and let it be known that the crisis facing millions of women and their children demands action now. And that's what this forum is about today. We want to raise the level of these issues so that when you leave here, you will begin talking about it and you, we can raise this to a level uh, of national dialogue that will uh, result in action. And today we're going to be talking about the three pillars of the women's economic agenda. First pillar, fair pay. And despite the progress we've made in women's rights, women across the country are still paid less than their male counterparts. Today, women make just 77 cents to every dollar that a man makes. And the situation is even worse for women of color. African American women are paid just 64 cents, and Hispanic women are paid just 54 cents to every dollar paid to a white male. This is unacceptable, and we will not stand for it. Moreover, we know that the minimum wage is a women's issue and thus a family issue. Nearly two-thirds of the minimum wage workers in this country are women. And in our current econ economy, minimum wage jobs aren't reserved anymore for high school teenager and their summer jobs. Minimum wage workers are hard-working men and women, many of whom have families to support and are living under the poverty line. 
for our families to subsist and survive in today's living conditions, we need to raise the minimum wage. and ensure that all Americans get equal and fair pay, regardless of their color, their race, or their gender. The second pillar we're gonna talk about is work and family balance. I know how hard it is to be a working mother, especially a single working mother. For years myself, as a single mother, I struggled every day to balance work and time with my three kids. It was a constant struggle to fulfill my obligations as an employee and my obligations as a mom. And women should not have to choose between her job and her family. We need to... We need to enact and support legislation that will protect the work and family balance. The third pillar, child care. Working parents must have access to quality and affordable child care. The economic reality is that very often a parent isn't at home to take care of children, and parents must have the ability to access child care they can trust and they can afford. The success of these three pillars, fair pay, work and family balance, and child care will significantly advance our women's economic agenda, contributing to the greater gender equality and thus a greater America. When women succeed, America succeed. So this is just the beginning. Congresswoman uh, Royval Allard and Congresswoman Napolitano and I are here today because we want to hear from you. Oh, Congresswoman Napolitano just arrived. There she is. Grace. Great. Glad she's here. Um, and we want to hear from you, and over the course of the next few hours, we will hear from advocates and experts and people like you who are facing these issues every day. Uh, we're going to hear from Senator Holly Mitchell, uh, Patty Castellanos, President Renee Martinez of LA City College, Sonia Rosales, a hotel worker who has a great story, Veronica Oropesa, a restaurant worker, and uh, Karen Hoopengarner, a graduate of Harbor Interfaith Shelter. Uh, so we look forward to this day. Do you hand me this for a reason? Well, oh, you want me to introduce? Just, oh. Just a few words. Okay, great. Absolutely. Bio, just, just, okay. <laughs> Whatever Grace tells me to do, I do. This is one thing that I learned very quickly in Congress, right? It's all about seniority. <laughs> you know, I mean, you don't get to speak, you don't get to ask questions in a committee if you're a, a youngin' like myself. So I am pleased uh, to introduce uh, the great Grace Napolitano. She represents the 32nd Congressional District. She sits on the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee with me. Uh, she's also on the subcommittees of Highway, uh, Railroads, Water. Her, she is the champion for water issues in Congress. Uh, anytime there's an issue about water in California, Grace Napolitano is fighting there for our interest here in California. She's the ranking uh, member on water and power in the Natural Resources Committee, and she's co-chair of the Mental Health Caucus. Grace Napolitano governs, leads, and champions from her heart, and no one has a better heart than for you and for fighting for you than Grace Napolitano. Grace. Thank you, Janice. That's very kind of you, and can you hear me now? Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, it's a pleasure, I, and, and I'm late because I was at a water for water uh, on the Superfund, getting a group of women that said, what's going on with San Gabriel Superfund, the, the contamination area? So we brought in uh, entities, parties, and they're in the meeting to being explained where they're at with it. So to me, that's important because you have to be empowered with information. So to be, thank you, Lucille, thank you, Janice, for the invitation to join you. Uh, I'm a mom and a, a grandmother and a great-grandmother. So to me, I started working at the age of 12. There was very little that we could expect from anybody back in the, uh, you know, I was born in 36. That gives you an idea how old I am. But you understand that, that there's been an evolution of programs. There weren't any at that time. I have five children. 
and they were latchkey kids. And I had to rely on, on either uh, the goodness of uh, my mother or somebody else that I could bring in uh, at those times. You didn't ask whether they were documented or not. You got help from wherever you could to be able to do in-home taking care of five kids. And being able to raise five children and being told, well, you know, you're a Latina. Well, you know, you're a, a female. Uh, can you do this? Have you ever had somebody tell you that to your face? So you understand, I understand, I've been there. And when you challenge them, but what you need to focus on is that you're better than, than taking that as a, a slight. You go beyond that because your focus has got to be what you know you can do because women work twice as hard, correct? So that we don't, I, I don't look back. I, I don't, you know, they told me that I couldn't do it. It's a challenge. I just move a little faster and a little harder. And you can accomplish whatever you want. Because I have a high school education, ladies and gentlemen. Where am I, where have I been, and where I am now is because of people like you that believe that women not only think it, speak it, but del corazón. They come from here because of their family, because of their background, because they know the issues that we all face. And the more you get women elected like this, the more you're going to see that change. Because it comes from that. So, and, and not, not political, but look, look at who's up here. People who care, people who move. Lucille has been working on health issues for I don't know how long. She is the ranking member. I mean, she is a, the senior member to me and many others. But we had people who opened the door for us. And don't forget, that's part of what you need to do. It's when you succeed at something, you help somebody else. You open the door and you guide them through. Because the more we all act, Together and as one, the more we will succeed. Because let me tell you, there are many men who are willing to help women. Pero están contaditos. There are very few that I have learned really care. You got one back in the audience. Thank you, sir. <laughs> but when you're. Hey, being, Julian. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you. And, and, and essentially, I've, I've been challenged many, many times in my lifetime. When they tell me I can't do it, I said, watch me. And then you just forge ahead, you don't look back, you don't blame anybody, you just do what you know you can do and what you must do to make things happen. So thank you ladies, I appreciate it and congratulations. I'm supposed to introduce our moderator. Uh, our moderator is Kimberly Freeman, and she is the Assistant Dean for Diversity Initiatives, um, Diversity Initiatives and Community Relations at UCLA. Thank you, Kimberly, so much for agreeing to be the moderator today. Thank you very much, Congresswoman, and thank you to everyone for having me here as your moderator. Um, this is such a full program, so we're going to get uh, right into the actual uh, presentations. I, I want to do some quick announcements. I was told I needed to um, share with everyone that there will be question cards during the course of the program. And so if you have questions, please fill out the cards, and that's how we will facilitate the Q&A period. Also, um, please note that the senior center restrooms are accessible and available, and there's coffee available, but it cannot be brought into council chambers. Okay, I have some elected officials to announce here. Um, the following elected officials are here with us today. Vice Mayor Anna Maria Quintana from the city of Bell. Mayor Michael McCormick from the city of Vernon. <laughs> Councilwoman Denise Robles from the city of Commerce. <laughs> Congresswoman Teresa Real Sebastian from the city of Monterey Park. <laughs> Barbara Dickerson from Citrus College Board of Trustees. Okay, we have Treasurer Yolanda Rodriguez from the City of Linwood. Mario Valadez, Montebello School District. 
Francine Gardia, Commissioner for the City of Bell Gardens. Sonia Lopez with Compton Community College. Leticia Vasquez, board member of Metropolitan Water District and director of Central Basin Municipal District. Ivan Altamiranos from the City of Commerce. And also Carmen Avalos from City Clerk from the City of Southgate and Cerritos College Board. And as Congresswoman Napolitano mentioned, um, it's important to support women candidates so that we can have a dais that looks like this in the future. So we have some, um, some people that are running for office here in the audience. We have Songhei Armstead for Judge um, 2014. <laughs> Tammy Blair, um, she's running for... Okay, Tammy Blair. Jason Gardia Stinnett, um, another candidate, Central Basin Municipal Water District. And Deborah Losnick for Superior Court Judge, Office Number 54. Okay, so thank you again. I'd like to introduce. Sydney Camlager, Community College District. So now I'd like to introduce the members of our panel who are going to be speaking on the three pillars today. Our first speaker is Patricia Castellanos, who works with Lane. And um, before working for Lane, she served as the Harbor Area Director for the Office of Mayor of the City of Los Angeles, and she was responsible in that job for coordinating the mayor's initiatives related to environment, economic development, and goods movement in the harbor. She joined Lane in 2006 as co-director of the Clean and Safe Ports Project, and for the past two years has been leading Lane's efforts to bring good jobs and clean air to the port trucking industry. Patricia. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. How's everyone doing? Um, I, uh, this is such a treat. I am so honored and humbled to uh, be before you all, but also in, um, you know, um, among these amazing uh, women leaders here. And I do appreciate and want to thank our congressional women leaders for convening this very important and very urgent discussion. Um, and of course, I want to especially thank my Congress member and woman, my Congresswoman Janice Hahn, who, uh, since I've known her, uh, her uh, history as an elected official has been spent fighting for working families and women, and so I, I, uh, we are very much aligned along those lines, so I appreciate all your work. Um, and glad to be here before you today uh, to speak on this issue. I come from a very long line of very strong and very hardworking women who came to this country to find a better life and fight for a better life for their families, and every day I have seen them do that, fight and struggle to make sure that their families have a better life than they did. And I am tremendously grateful for the path that they have forged for me and for, um, for, for the rest of my family and, and you know, other women in, in, in LA in this country that have done the same. Um, I'm currently, as, as uh, was already said, the Deputy Director at the LA Alliance for, the, for a New Economy. Um, and we have spent the last 20 years since we've been founded pushing for, developing, and advocating policies that lift the floor for working families across LA, across the region, and, and nationally as well. Um, and we are, we're also currently in the, in the middle of a, of a project called Raise LA to lift the floor for hotel workers across the city of Los Angeles. And I do hope to spend a moment talking about that towards the end of my presentation. Um, and we will also hear from Sonia Rosales, who's a hotel worker, um, speak personally about her, her, um, her work as a hotel worker and the impacts that that has on her personally and her family. So I'm very uh, honored to be joined by her today. Um, so when we talk about 
you know, I, I, the con Congresswoman Hahn said, minimum wage is a woman's issue. Um, lifting the, the wage floor is a woman's issue. It's a family issue. And I want to spend a little bit of time talking about that because that's something that um, in my work at Lane and that, that we spent uh, quite a bit of time not just talking about, but actually doing something about. Um, and so when you look at today's minimum wage and the, our current wages and buying power for working families, we, fa we find that it falls incredibly short of what it's supposed to. I think when our members of Congress first instituted the minimum wage, they really thought that they were creating a, a wage that would help families live well, um, to be able to cover the, the, the basic costs that you needed to support a family to, um, to carry on with your, with your life. And so we are currently far from that original intent. So according to a recent study by the Center for Community Economic Development, 30% of California households have incomes that are too low uh, to cover their basic cost, and found that that was uh, true for 65% of women-headed households. And so we, are, we have a lot of ground to cover and a lot of catching up to do. And you know, having uh, grown up in a, in a working class family surrounded in a, you know, in a working class community, I've often thought, you know, and I see in, in, in my community organizing experience in, in low wage communities, um, often think to myself like, wow, these, these families, these women are performing miracles every day. Every day they are managing to stretch a penny, stretch a dollar to make sure that their families have food on the table, that their kids have clothes on their backs, that they're sending them to, to school well fed and that they have a roof over their head. But when I watch my family and when I watch these women in the communities, these are not miracles at all. There are real and true sacrifices that are being made every day. They are making choices about the quality of education, about the quality of childcare, about the quality of food that they can provide for their families. And these are sacrifices that no one should be having to make. And so these are things that we need to change and that's why there is a level of urgency that we need to approach this issue with. Um, so what would happen if we raise the floor? Um, we've, I'm sure, all heard the, you know, many, uh, many say that the sky will fall, that, you know, the economy will collapse, that it's just something that cannot be done. Recently, just focusing on, on LA, the Economic Roundtable uh, released a study to answer that question, what would happen if we raised the minimum wage? What would happen if we raised, raised the, the wage floor? And they looked at a wage of $15 an hour as the minimal standard of well-being in a high-cost urban area like Los Angeles. $15 an hour honestly is not a lot. It, I think, it comes to about 26, a little above $26,000 a year. So these are not families that are going to be buying the second vacation home on some island somewhere. Um, this is just to make sure that they're covering their, their basic cost. Um, and they, they've also uh, mentioned that in Los Angeles, 47% of women make below that, that, that standard. And so while paying a decent wage for workers uh, and for families is the right thing to do, I think I, I want to ask us to shift our paradigm a little to, yes, it is the right thing to do, and we, we should feel good about fighting for that and doing, doing that. But honestly, it is one of the best economic stimulus packages that we can in create here in LA and across the country. So it is morally right, but it is also good for our economy. So here's what happens. If we were to raise the floor, if we were to raise the minimum wage to $15 in LA, what would happen? We, are put, we would be putting $7.6 billion a year more into working families' pockets. So that is a huge number. So this is good for workers, it's good for working families, but let's move beyond that individual family, that individual household to look at what, what it does. What happens when low wage workers, minimum wage workers earn a better living? They're not investing it in Wall Street. We all know that. They are spending money at the grocery store. They are spending money at the movie theater because maybe now they can take their kids to a movie once in a while. They are spending uh, money at Target. I know I do. <laughs> um, and so we are putting that money back into our local economies. Um, so that, that is an economic boom for, for our region, for, for our cities. Um, 
when, uh, but, so that, that is our local economy. Businesses will also benefit from an increase in the minimum wage. Increased spending means that there are added sales, right? As a business, you want to sell more product, and this is something that uh, an increased minimum wage will afford. It also provides increased uh, tax revenue for local, state, and our federal um, governments. We estimate, the Economic Roundtable estimates that $9.2 billion will be put back into the economy in annual sales just in LA County alone if we were to raise that floor. That, more sales, leads to more jobs, and the estimation is that there'll be a, a close to 64,000 new jobs created because of this stimulant. So this is, again, not just about the right thing to do. This is something that is good for our economy and something that is sorely needed in a time when we're coming right off of a, one of the worst recessions that we've experienced. Um, and then as, as business owners, I think you know, we've, we've seen many studies, a higher minimum wage creates more stability in the workforce. Mm -hmm. And having long-term stable workforce for any business is something that they want. Um, to be able to retain because when you have to recruit and train new employees and new staff that costs you more money as as a, as an employer and so this is a win-win situation all the way around it's good for families it's good for our economy and as we know this you know as already has been said uh, women are overrepresented in low-wage sectors and so we this is something that there there is urgency in creating now I want to spend just a little bit of time giving an example of what happens in an industry if we were to focus just on what one industry um, in, in looking at the, the wages and increasing the wage floor. As I mentioned earlier, uh, Lane is currently uh, in, engaged in a pro one of our projects is Raise LA, um, and we are seeking to raise the minimum wage for hotel workers across the city of Los Angeles. So um, right now, the, hospi the hospitality industry is, is an industry that's on the rise. They are, they are seeking, after the recession, to increase capacity, to have more rooms. To We are bringing more tourism into this region than ever before. And uh, the hotel industry is faring fairly well right now. It is, however, also the largest low-wage sector in the region. 40% of LA's hospitality workers right now are living in poverty. That seems unacceptable in an industry that is, that is growing and, and profiting, profiting tremendously. So raising the wages for hospitali hospitali uh, excuse me, hospitality workers alone will stimul stimulate LA's economy to the tune of $73 million a year. And this will affect uh, over 15,000 workers throughout the city and throughout the region. Uh, with women making up half of the workforce and being heavily represented uh, in this low-wage sector, increasing the women's, uh, women's wages in this sector and in other sectors really will be a huge economic boom. And again, it's something that we all need to take very seriously and work really hard to make sure we're getting the ball rolling on this. So again, thank you very much. And um, uh, I think that's it. Thank you, Patricia. So when women succeed, working families and local economies succeed. You've heard from our expert, and now we'd like to hear from one of the members of the community. Sonia Morales, could you please join us at the mic? Her interpreter will be Patricia. I will try my best. <laughs> uh, buenos días. Uh, Dios les bendiga. Es un honor para mí estar aquí delante de tanta mujer luchadora, mujer valiente que pelea por cada una de nosotras las mujeres trabajadoras. Uh, yo so, trabajo en un hotel. Me deja, me permite traducirle. Sí. sí. Uh, <laughs> Ay, perdón, perdón. <laughs> Disculpe. Um, uh, so my name is uh, Sonia Rosales, and I'm I'm very honored to be uh, with you with so many strong women that are fighting every day for working working women in our community. Ah, yo trabajo en el área de hotel, soy recamarera. Ah, el trabajo de nosotros es un trabajo fuerte, un trabajo estresante, un trabajo que nosotros hacemos diariamente. Mujeres 
a quizás mujer, mucha de la mayoría de la mujer, mujer soltera, que tiene que soportar a sus hijos, que tiene que llevar el alimento diariamente, que levantamos a las 5 de la mañana, regresamos a las 7 de la noche, quizás probablemente para poder ganar un poco más de dinero para poder sostener a nuestros hijos. El propósito nuestro es de que nuestros hijos tengan mejores condiciones de vida, que puedan ir al colegio, que puedan ir a la universidad, que ellos salgan de donde nosotros estamos. Pero este trabajo para nosotros deja cicatrices en nuestra vida, cicatrices por la clase de trabajo que es fuerte y duro, como nuestras manos que ustedes pueden ver, nuestros brazos que están operados, pero nosotros luchamos para poder sacar adelante a nuestras familias. Yo particularmente le doy gracias a Dios por las personas que están aquí luchando por la mujer que hace el trabajo que muchas veces nadie quiere hacer. Patricia. Nosotros contribuimos a la economía de este país, al crecimiento de este país. Por tanto, nosotros necesitamos y queremos que nos den una igualdad de sueldo. Porque cuando nosotros obtengamos esa igualdad de sueldo, nosotros vamos a contribuir a estar más tiempo con nuestras familias, a que haya mejor sociedad dentro del país, a que podamos nosotros, cuando uno de nuestros hijos nos pida, ir, por ejemplo, a un centro de diversiones como Legoland, no decirles para el próximo verano, para el próximo verano. Patricia. Sí. Ok. <laughs> like I said, I'm going to try my best. Um, So, uh, uh, Sonia says, uh, I'm a hotel worker, I'm a housekeeper um, at, a, at a hotel, and this is backbreaking work. It is very hard work. Uh, the majority of the women do, or the majority of the people doing this work are women, um, many of them single women that are working very long hours and making many sacrifices towards the end of earning a little more money so that they can support their families and in hopes that their kids have a better life than the life that they have. Um, but this work, as she says, leaves scars, and she was pointing to her scars. It's backbreaking work um, that leaves physical scars on the workers that are in this industry. But we fight every day and we work every day to get, get our kids out front to make sure they have a good life. Um, And I'm happy, you know, glad to be among women that fight for women that do the work that sometimes other people do not want to do, don't want to do because it is hard work. We as workers, we as women workers contribute to this economy and all we're asking for is equity and pay and to have a better wages and equal wages. And we want to be able to provide for our kids and look forward to that day when we're not, when our kids ask us if they can go to Legoland to not have to respond to them maybe next year. También quiero decirles a cada una de ustedes que nosotras es un gusto hacer nuestro trabajo, amamos nuestro trabajo. Amamos nuestro trabajo porque sabemos que con lo poco o lo mucho que hacemos, contribuimos al crecimiento de nuestras familias, al crecimiento de la nación, pero también queremos que nos valoren, que ellos vean o que las personas vean que somos mujeres trabajadoras, mujeres que dejamos nuestra fuerza en cada cuarto, en cada pasillo de los hoteles o del lugar donde trabajen, que nosotros somos mujeres que nos esforzamos, que quizás nadie lo ve, pero dentro de cada habitación lloramos, porque nosotros decimos tenemos que terminar el trabajo, tenemos que llevar el alimento a nuestros hogares, tenemos que contribuir. Hay muchas de nosotras que muchas veces cuando estamos haciendo el trabajo, tanto es el estrés, la adrenalina de terminar, el deseo de acabar el trabajo, que nos lastimamos. Al final del día vemos nuestra cabeza quizás rota y decimos, no tengo tiempo, no tengo tiempo, tengo que acabar el trabajo. Pero por ese salario que nosotros sabemos que va a contribuir a nuestras familias, nosotros lo hacemos. Lo hacemos por cada uno de nosotros, nuestros hijos, nuestras familias quizás que dejamos atrás, con las cuales contribuimos también y por cada una de las personas, porque amamos este país, pasamos a ser parte de este país y amamos este país y por eso contribuimos al crecimiento de este país, 
pero por tanto necesitamos mejores condiciones de vida para nuestros hijos, mejores lugares donde ellos puedan estar para que los puedan cuidar, mejores escuelas, pero solamente lo vamos a lograr por medio de la economía y de la igualdad, del, del crecimiento, de la igualdad monetaria que a nosotros nos pueden brindar. Gracias. Gracias. She says, I, um, I want to tell each of you that we love our jobs. I love my job. I love to know that I'm contributing to the betterment of my family and that I'm pr contributing to this country. But we want to be valued as people. Often what you don't see about hotel workers and um, housekeepers at hotels is that we do cry. We cry in our rooms because of the pressure of the job, but we know we need to finish the job and we know we need to get home to our kids and we know that we need to, put, uh, we need to provide for our families. We often suffer injuries on the job, but we don't tend to them because, again, we need to fi make sure we, are finished, we, we finish the job and that there's nothing that prevents us from taking home that paycheck. We do it for our kids, we do it for our families, and we do it because we came here to be part of this country. We love this country, we want to contribute, we want to continue to contribute to this country and to our families, but in order to continue to do so, we really need to um, improve the living conditions for our families, and that really is is only um, one way, the best way to do that is economically through better wages um, and uh, to improve the economy. Thank you. Thank you. We will now move on to pillar two, work and family balance. And our speaker is going to be Renee Martinez. Renee has worked in the community, in the field of community college education for more than 36 years. Throughout her career, a top priority has been to serve as a role model to all students and staff members, demonstrating what can be attained through setting positive goals and working hard. She supports her staff members by encouraging them to be independent in their work environment, to further their education, and to provide good customer service to all needing their assistance and support. In August of 2012, Renee was appointed as interim president of the Los Angeles City College by the chancellor of the Los Angeles Community College District. Renee. Well, I too am honored to be here. Matter of fact, I can't believe I'm going to pinch myself that I am here. Basically, and I do want to say that on May of 2013, I became permanent president for Los Angeles City College. I am the 16th president and the first Latina. In talking about work and family balance, I know that all of you deal with it every single day. Uh, I fortunately now my child has grown and now I have grandchildren, but my balance is to try to see my grandchildren and spend some quality time and to make time for them to come spend evenings with me and do some fun things. But all my career, I have been working on, on two issues. And one is worthy wages and also quality preschools and education for our children. Over 30 years ago, when I first started working as an early childhood educator, I thought and got involved in worthy wages because the people that were working in the child care centers were barely making minimum wage. That hasn't changed significantly in the 30 years. They still are making minimum wage, and uh, that's not a living wage. We all know that. It's not a living wage. How do we change this? We get more involved with our children and our, our politicians right here to make sure that things happen. I know that it's already been talked about in terms of worthy wages, but I, what I want to emphasize is that many of these programs do not provide any sick time when people are sick. I remember when I was a director of a preschool and parents would bring their children to the school with a fever, right? And they brought them to school with a fever because if they had called work and said they were sick, okay, they could possibly lose their job. So it was better if I called them and said, 
your child is sick and you need to pick them up. And that, because of that, they were allowed to leave work and it was not, they were not penalized as much. But I don't know how many people tell me, because my child had the chicken pox, because my child had the measles and I had to be out for over a week, I've lost my job. This is wrong. This is wrong. Workers in 145 countries around the world have earned paid sick days. But there is no policy in the United States to ensure paid sick days. This needs to change. The United States does not have any mandatory paid family leave policy, making it one of just three countries in the world and the only country among industrialized countries that do not mandate paid maternity leave for new mothers. This is a challenge that we have still. And I know that there was a uh, discussion about how much money uh, women of color make uh, in terms of, of the future, but pay equity is something that we have talked about for 50 years. 50 years ago, Kennedy said, pay equity, and it's still not there. Many of our children that, that go to school, go to school hungry. One out of four children go to school hungry. This is unacceptable. 16 million children in our world today, you know, um, are not met in terms of their needs. Many of our parents, because they do not have any kind of insurance, okay, in addition to being unable to miss work, but because they don't have insurance, they only take their children to the doctor when it's an emergency. I've been on a hospital board for seven years. The emergency rooms are booming, and they're booming with people that could be cared for in urgent care, not in emergency care, where they have to pay full value. And that's why I'm a strong component believer in Obamacare. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Matter of fact, the Los Angeles Community College District had a focus for one whole week. All nine colleges provided uh, opportunities for our students to apply for Obamacare and, uh, and brought in health services and resources for our, our students to know what's going on and to help them because so many of our students do not have the appropriate health care that they need in order to, to work and to be successful in school. I know that when I was a child care worker, I was very, very fortunate because I worked for a public school system and uh, was allowed to have 10 days of, pick, of paid illness time. But I will assure you that those 10 days, I wasn't sick. It was my child who was sick, and that's why I stayed home. And that is unacceptable. That is unacceptable. Um, and unfortunately, we still have many of those child care centers that do not provide for benefits. And if they do, they charge their employees for those benefits, and they're from three to $400 a month. Okay. The second issue that I've, I've worked for is, is quality education, not just for young children, but for all. We statistically now see that uh, unrepresented cultures, especially Latinos, now represent 60% of students in community colleges. This is unbelievable to see this statistic, but the numbers in terms of their completion is disheartening. We've got to get them there, but we've got to keep them. We've got to keep them so that they go on and that they get a worthy wage so that they can live okay, and get those benefits. So many of our programs uh, do not provide for our students to get a good salary. So good education, whether it be a certificate, a degree, or now a transfer program, is going to ensure not only that they're successful, but that they are good citizens. And that's what we want, to promote good citizens. I think um, what I wanted to really emphasize that um, when I started teaching at a community college, I was a child development teacher, obviously. <laughs> 
But more importantly, I wanted people to know about cultures, that not everybody was the same, that we are alike, but yet we're different, and to value those traditions, to value those cultures, and to make children proud of who they are. And even to make children understand that when they make mistakes, that those are the things that they learn from. Sometimes just being so good at something, you really don't, it doesn't click. But when you make a mistake, you truly, truly learn. And so I started advocacy groups because I felt that our students not only needed to know about how children grew, what they needed to do uh, to encourage that development, but also that they had a significant voice in the future of children. And so we encouraged advocacy groups, clubs that work with students to get them to see that there was life behind life besides Soto Street, life beyond Soto Street, I'm sorry. Many times I used to talk to students and I'd say, well, did you go here, did you go there? No. So we started taking students to Sacramento. We started taking them to conferences in other states so that they would know what life was beyond just in that community college, which is so, so important. I was born and raised in East Los Angeles I don't think I ever thought I would ever become a president of a college. I was, my plan was to be a teacher. Both my parents worked, and for a time, my grandmother of 10 children came and watched us. And then when she moved away, I went to a child care center in East Los Angeles at, at Hamill Street when I was four years of age. And maybe that's why I got so involved in child care. 17 years later, I became the director of that same child care center. <laughs> but I want you to know that that child care center had over 60 parents waiting to get in. 60 parents waiting to get in. And what was really disillusioning is that when you work for a Head Start, a child care, in a city program, it's based on a sliding scale so that you had to be make very little money or had to be in a program such as our CalWORKs programs that helps working parents or, or working students get a job and get a skill. But what was very disillusioning to me is that when they finally got that degree, when they finally got paid a better wage, they didn't qualify for the program anymore. They became the working poor, okay? That is unacceptable. We, we have created programs to help our people to be successful, not to hold them back, uh, right? So, when you vote, when you walk that talk, you think about the need for our women and our single parents, men, that they need paid illness days. They need to be able to take a leave and feel comfortable that they're guaranteed that they will have a job when they come back, okay? And, and let's face it, nobody can survive without any money when they're on leave. They need to still be able to pay that rent, pay that, buy the food, and take care of their children. Also that we need to make sure that we expand our family and medical leave so that it's not short term. It's bad enough now when a woman has a baby in a hospital, they, they literally kick you out in two days, uh, okay? So if we can expand that medical leave so that the family is, is in stable condition when they go back in. I know that when I had my daughter, I thought, oh, you know, I taught this, I talked about delivery, I talked about all the things, and I said, I'm going to go back and teach in a month. Six months later, <laughs> I went back to teach, because it wasn't that easy, right? <laughs> and and I, I admire all these women here with five children and three children, and, uh, because you can do it. But making sure that our federal employees get paid parental leave, I think, is critical. And last, I just want to say that balancing this is critical. I used to work with parents, and I would be amazed. I'd go do home visits, 
and they did not even have books and so we had to provide books for them they didn't have a television maybe that was a blessing because sometimes i think we put children in front of televisions and 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 they don't get anything but more importantly that you need to balance life is all about balance but lastly remember as as this young woman who worked in the house in the hotel said that she loved her job well she loved her job and wants to be good and wants opportunities for her children to go on and go into college you can make that happen if you want it and we are lucky because we're in a country that believes in these opportunities get out and vote and make things change thank you What, one of the challenges with being the moderator is we have so many rich stories to tell, but I'm going to have to really be taskmaster now because we're going over our time allotment. Um, we will next hear a personal story from Ms. Zenaida Torres, and please keep your remarks to three minutes. I understand she also has an interpreter. Buenos días. Mi nombre es Zenaida Torres. Soy miembro de Rock LA. Un centro de oportunidades para trabajadores de restaurantes y mi trabajo es de fines de semana. Eh, cuando trabajo desde siempre, a veces que mi niña, mi hija se enferma, tengo que buscar quién me la cuide. Bueno, siempre, pero desde cuando se enferma me voy preocupada a mi trabajo. No sé si, si, si va a mejorar o va a seguir o va a bajar su, su enfermedad, lo que tenga y, de este, y si le van a dar su medicamento a tiempo. Entonces, este, pues, me, cuando estoy en mi trabajo siempre me siento muy preocupada, muy presionada de, de no saber de, de cómo sigue. Entonces, este, no me puedo, pues, no, no me puedo, me, me siento siempre presionada, re, nerviosa y ya hasta que regreso a mi casa me tranquilizo. Could you push the, the green button? Sorry. Hi, my name is Anaida Torres, and I am a single mother. I work in El Mercadito in East LA, and I usually have the weekend shifts. Um, my, my daughter usually um, gets sick, and it's very hard for me to perform my job, at my work, and uh, I usually worry whether she takes her medicine or if she's going to get well or worsen, since I have to leave it in care of a friend. Si nosotros recibiéramos un salario, bueno, si, si nosotros recibiéramos salario por días de enfermedad, yo pienso que yo estaría más tranquila trabajando en el lugar, cometería menos, eh, menos errores y además me sentiría más comprometida en mi trabajo para hacer un más mejor. If I was able to receive pay sick days, I would be... Um... I would be better off uh, taking care of my child and would be able to perform better at my job. And I think that that would be um, good for my boss as well. Sería fabuloso que si nos pagaran nuestros días de enfermedad. So it would be great if we would get our uh, basic days. Thank you. Okay, we now come to our third pillar, and um, we will hear from California State Senator Holly Mitchell. And I was reviewing some of the previous uh, When Women Succeed, America Succeeds forums, and noticed that when um, Senator Mitchell spoke, uh, she was always introduced as being a mother first, because she is very passionate about raising her son, Ryan. So um, as, state as a state assembly member and a mother, Senator State Senator Mitchell understands the concerns of working families and seeks to improve the quality and accessibility of the state, state's health and education systems. Serving as the chair of the California's Legislative Black Caucus, State Senator Mitchell has a strong commitment to community needs and family-focused policymaking. Senator Mitchell. So like my colleagues have mentioned, it's, it, it's an incredible honor to be here with three amazing women members of Congress. California is so lucky because in California, <laughs> girls rock in Congress. So I am thrilled. Girls rock. 
And uh, if you weren't mad when you got here this morning, you need to be mad when you leave, because I know I am. <laughs> so, Congresswoman Royal Allard, let me make sure I understand this. As a black woman, I'm earning 67 cents on the dollar. So in my four years in the legislature, every bill I've gotten to the governor's desk, he signed. And not many, if any, of my male counterparts have that same distinction. So I didn't put 67% effort into it. Ms. Rosales doesn't put 58% effort into the job she loves. We put 100% effort into it. So I want my money. And uh, I want to thank Mayor Pro Tem Leon for opening it up by encouraging us all to look for leadership opportunities in our community because that is the only way in which it's going to change. Because I also don't intend to come back here in 50 years to continue <laughs> to have the conversation about income inequality, pay equity, and another war on poverty. I don't know about you, but we need to be spending the next 50 years talking about something else, which means we need to solve the problem now. Uh, I'm proud to be here uh, as a member, uh, active member of the California Legislative Women's Caucus to talk about the role we play at the state level to support the three pillars um, um, that the uh, Democratic Women's Caucus um, have brought us, have gathered us here today and similar town halls like this all across the country. And it's important that we talk about all levels of government and how we're all going to support the same three pillars for a variety of reasons. But first of all, from my perspective, when California women succeed, right. yes. our children thrive right. and the California economy will flourish. Right. Mm -hmm. Those are all directly connected. It's like three legs to a stool. When we are earning the full value equal to our male counterparts, our children thrive, and when our children thrive, the economy thrives. Right. As President Clinton said at the Democratic Convention, that's basic arithmetic. That's not complex, right? right? And so those are the policies that we've got to work collectively, the federal level, the state legislature, and the community level to help make happen. I'm going to touch on two issues, child care uh, and education equity. And I'm going to talk a little bit about women and children living in poverty at the state of California. Child care is a critical pillar when talking about women succeeding. And I've spent most of my professional career, I was a former CEO of Crystal Stairs, working on child care issues. Our investment in child care is what m helps keep California working. Without child care, we can't go to work. And so that's a basic fundamental right that we as working women, working families, and our children should have access to. According to the California Budget Project, since 20, 2007 and 8, my colleagues in the state legislature have cut a total annual funding for our subsidized child care and preschool by nearly 40%. Over a hundred million dollars has been removed from the child care subsidized program in the state of California. What did that cost all of us? About one quarter of the child care slots for low income working families. 110,000 child care slots. The challenge with that, which is what I tell the governor on a regular basis, is three year olds don't get a do over, <laughs> right? When we cut those child care slots in 07, 08, and we haven't replaced them, and this is 2014, that's a whole cadre of preschoolers. That's a whole cadre of babies zero to five that didn't get access to what we all know early care and education settings will do. It makes them school ready. It helps prepare them. It will help kind of balance out the education equity challenges we're experiencing every day. NPR ran a study yesterday from the Office of Civil Rights and the Federal Department of Education that talked about preschool suspension rates for black and brown babies. African American kids constitute 18% of the preschool population across the country, but 60% of the suspension rates. Who's suspending four-year-olds? <laughs> 
So it's not only about access to preschool and high quality child care, it's making sure that our children, children of color, are being treated fairly and are, are, are in, in, in supportive, enriching environments to help set the stage for their lifelong learning experience. So education equity is something that we've got to focus on. The California Legislative Women's Caucus in supporting when America succeeds, when, when women succeed, America succeeds, is in the process now of making child care our top priority for reinvestment in the California state budget. Yes. We have a governor in this great state, unfortunately, who doesn't quite get the value of child care as evidenced by the fact, by his state budget in January. We've got a $6 billion surplus and no, I don't even want to say new money, no reinvestment in child care. I told you we lost 110,000 slots in 07, 08. We've made some pretty good strides the last couple of years, but those slots, those chairs are still empty. And so the Women's Caucus, working with our colleagues in Congress, are going to put forth every effort we can collectively to talk about these children don't get a do-over. That's a fundamental problem for us. And if there's excess dollars in the, in the state general fund, we're going to direct some of that money to child care. Let's Let's talk about child poverty. One in four Los Angeles County children live in poverty. The child poverty rate in California is number one in the nation. Not Alabama, not Mississippi. The great state of California. Not on our collective watch anymore. We have got to make our children, which is our state's top resource, our priority. And so while we talk about K through 12 and we talk about child care, we've got to talk about what babies experience when they're home. The Senate and Assembly uh, Human Services Committee had a joint hearing last year, and there are two institutes on the study of poverty in California, one at UC Davis, one at Stanford. And the directors came and showed us um, brain scan images of a child born into poverty, and one not. And it was like the difference in looking at an I Love Lucy episode and the new 3D HD TV <laughs> where it pops up off the screen at you. The children born into poverty literally at three years old, their brain scans, you could see gray, vast areas of non-synopsis where they're not spoken to. The language development isn't on par with their their peers from higher socioeconomic strata in preschool. And so what that taught me in a core, deep place that I can't begin to shed that image is if we don't get it right the first time, we will pay for that baby indefinitely. Mm -hmm. We will pay for that baby and enhance K through 12. We talk about the, the cradle to prison pipeline. We will pay for that baby indefinitely because we sold them short in the formative years. Again, it's very simple. We've got to invest. I'm going to ask you to, to watch out for a number of pieces of legislation coming to the state level. One bill I, I'm very proud to carry, SB 899, and it's called the Maximum Family Grant. Under the Pete Wilson administration, they passed a piece of legislation that said that if you were on CalWORKs and you had a second baby, we weren't going to increase your family grant. Because he believed, <laughs> Mayor Pro Tem Leon, that a woman would have another baby for an additional $122 a month. <laughs> Is that the most offensive thing you ever heard of in your life? Right. Anybody in here, now I'm an adoptive parent. So I wouldn't got mine. But anybody <laughs> in here who's had a baby, you know that it wasn't for an additional $122 a month. <laughs> and poor women have suffered under that oppressive policy ever since. 15 states have reversed it, 15 red states. It's time for California to step up. 
because while it had zero impact on the birth rate, zero, there is a direct correlation between when California's child poverty rate began to inch up at a meteoric level and when that policy passed. So what that says to me is we are punishing poor children for being born into poor families. Being poor is not a crime. It's a hopefully temporary state of being that we can establish appropriate government policies to help lift to help support women lift their children out of deep poverty. That's why I ran for office. That's why I'm here today. And that's why I'm hoping that all of you will leave here a little more angry, a little more informed than when you got here this morning and go back into your communities with a plan of action, which this women's agenda, the three pillars, give us a wonderful framework to all work collectively around. We've heard some amazing statistics today, so I hope that when you leave, that you leave here with one or two action items in your own mind. I hope that you will write letters in support of my SB 899. I hope that you will follow the legislation at the congressional level and all of my colleagues in the Women's Caucus, because understand that we understand the value of electing women because we bring our real life experience to the policy making bodies. That's the lens through which we view these public policy issues. And that's the lens through which we will collectively come up with realistic solutions that help the economy, that help working women. Because when California women succeed, our children thrive, and the California economy will flourish. Thank you. Thank you so much, Senator Mitchell. And now we would like to hear a personal story from Karen Hoopengarner, who I know practiced her remarks, so she will be under two minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, my, I'm Karen Hoopengarner. I just want to touch on how um, having affordable health um, child care has helped me accomplish my goals. Um, so I started with Harbor Interfaith Services about 18 months ago. I entered their all program, which is uh, assistance in uh, rental for heads of households pursuing educational goals. Um, at, when I entered the program, I enrolled my, um, my daughter, who was one at the time, into their child care services that they offer. And I can honestly say that it's been the best decision I've ever made. Um, more than just convenience and the affordability, it's, it's given her opportunities that I couldn't have given her without that service. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, most women in my position would have had to put education on hold and um, just focus on, on getting a job to support their family however they could. But with these services from Harbor Interfaith, I've been able to focus completely on my education to one day not just have a job, but a career. And um, <laughs> so um, when I started at their program, I was at a junior college. And this past spring, I received my associates in business administration. And <laughs> And I'm now at Cal State LA working on my bachelor's in accounting. Wow. <laughs> um, and my accomplishments could not have been made without the help of Harbor Interfaith and all the director ladies that have made the way for me. You know, um, and it's not just. It's more than just having enough hours to accomplish my studying goals and. And, and, and going to classes, it's, it's knowing, it's the peace of mind of knowing that she is safe for that time. She, she's there nine hours a day, and, and I know that those teachers that work with her care not just about her well-being and her success in life, but also my own. And they want me to succeed just as much they want her to succeed. And she's almost three now, and... And she 
I see it every day compared to children that have not gone to, gone to preschool and that she is leaps and bounds ahead and her vocabulary and speech is so advanced for her age and and I'm so grateful for for having them behind me and and um, you know I just want to say um, that I'm so and I'm so grateful for them and and I hope that these services remain available for women in the future that that just need a helping hand in getting through a tough situation. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. By the way, Harbor Interfaith is in San Pedro. <laughs> you know, I want to introduce another uh, woman who uh, currently she's the mayor of Manhattan Beach, and uh, she is uh, running for the state senate to join incredible women like Holly Mitchell uh, to fight for women's agenda. So please uh, welcome Amy Howarth is here. Okay, so um, now comes the hard part. We have so many great questions um, and a short amount of time to try to address a few of them, but I know that all of these cards will be taken and um, given to the congressional offices for follow-up. Um, the first is actually, um, it's about the My Brother's Keepers initiative. Um, President Obama's initiative, My Brother's Keepers, would allow $500 million to go to communities of need to provide services for males. What are con the congressional offices planning to do to ensure the resources come to our communities? Who would like to take that question? Ooh. Congresswoman Hahn? Well, you know, I, I appreciate that. And, and frankly, uh, I represent the community of Watts, uh, both of the city council and also in Congress. And I got to tell you, I've been extremely disappointed uh, of recent that uh, the, uh, the promise zones uh, completely left out the community of Watts and uh, we were just applied for a choice neighborhood initiative to redevelop Jordan Downs, which would really help women, uh, help families, help our economy and really transform people's lives and uh, Watts was again passed over. So uh, I'm pretty angry and I think the, the, uh, our, our brother's keepers uh, as well as promise zones, I mean, communities like Watts are poster child uh, for those initiatives. So I will be uh, trying again very hard uh, to make sure that the, the president's initiatives really do come to the communities that are most in need. Unfortunately, the way it's been working, it seems like those who already have get more, and those communities who never have, uh, never are even in the running. So we're going to work better. I know I have written the President a letter. I've ri written uh, the Secretary of HUD a letter saying, let's work on the criteria so that those communities that really need these initiatives really have an honest shot at getting them. So. Janice, why don't we ask them to come and talk to the community and tour the zones. Like I bring them in in my area in transportation and other areas. They need to actually see it, feel it, and hear from the public. That was my letter uh, to uh, Sean Donovan, who was not going to even tell the communities that lost out till after summer. And I thought, you know what? They deserve to hear n now why their community was left out. And I want you to see the faces as you tell these families why they weren't in line to have these resources. So I'm with you, Grace. Okay, this is, this is exciting because this is all happening in real time, so I'm like multitasking here. Um, <laughs> um, someone says there's a fourth pillar. When women succeed, we all succeed. Women should um, be free from sexual abuse and assault. In the U.S. Armed Forces, there are at least 20% sexually assaulted um, women when women follow the chain of command, they are rebuffed and alienated. And there's quite a bit here. Let's see. Senator Kristen Gillibrand has done um, more. Has done, um, I guess, some things, but more has to be done. 
And that, so let's talk about this issue of sexual assault and, um, and rape of women in the armed forces. Would anyone like to take that on as a question? that um, th this is, of, of course, a very, very serious issue. And it isn't just in the armed forces. Mm -hmm. We have uh, domestic violence and sexual assaults throughout this country. And that's always, that issue has been a focus of mine. But um, Senator uh, Gillibrand really deserves a lot of credit because she has been going up against uh, our armed services, the generals, and everyone who have been fighting her. And in the House, Congresswoman Jackie Speer yeah. has also taken this on as, as her issue. And, and the fact that this issue continues to be raised by the women who are in Congress, we have, we have not been able to address it. The senator was not successful, but she didn't lose by a whole lot. And it really is an example of why it is so important for women in this country to become politically involved and politically active. And by that, I mean not just going out there and, and picketing. I'm saying that women should come out and they should vote and they should pressure those who are in elected office to support the issues that are important to them. I can honestly tell you that women have tremendous power. And the leaders of both parties in the administration, regardless of who they are, are always looking to see what are the women thinking. They are afraid of losing the women's vote. And if we vote in mass and that we hold our elected officials accountable for the, making sure that they support the issues that are important to us as women, not just when we're talking about sexual assault, but all the issues that we have raised here. Like, let's write and say that we want to support Holly's bill. That is a critical bill. Do you think, do you think for one minute the elected officials who are going to have to vote on this bill, if they get letters from all of you, the voters, the women, they're going to think twice about voting against that. So we have tremendous power. I know I got a little off the subject, but you know what? It doesn't matter what the issue is. The fact is that women have tremendous power, and that power is political power. And, it, and you know what? A lot of times in the district, people say, but I'm not a citizen. I can't vote. Well, there, it doesn't mean you can't be politically active. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean you can't help your neighbors or members of your family who can vote to babysit while you go out to, uh, while they go out to vote, to drive them to the polls. Everyone has power to make a difference. Mm -hmm. And it is going to be yeah. in the ballot box because everything we've talked about here is decided in the political arena. Right. And we have to make sure that those who represent us will represent us in the, the best way that they possibly can so that we can have our children safe, our children educated, so we can make decent live, living wages mm -hmm. and all the other issues that we talked about today. Mm -hmm. well. That right on, Lucille. Now you know what kind of a champion you have in Washington. Uh, I, I'll go a, another way. How many of you do social media? Twitter, Facebook. Well, do you know if you were to put something on this issue and you would refer them to, to uh, support the senator's bill and maybe send not only to Washington but to Lucille's, when uh, uh, Senator Gillibrand and the, on the Senate side, support her bill and inundate them with, you know, they look at the social media because then they can get the temperature of what the people are thinking about. So if you do, you've got to put something there that is going to hit them to be able to respond, not, not necessarily to you directly, but on the floor or in a bill and being able to understand that women are upset, they're fed up with it, and they're not going to stand for it anymore. The other area is uh, mental health, because even in the, uh, the our, our speakers, our, our hotel workers, our uh, young lady, the, the issues are mental stress. Now, you don't have to be saying that you're uh, mentally ill and you have to be committed. All the pressures, the stress, everything, all of this has an impact on your ability, not only to take care of your children, to do your job, to be effective wherever it is. 
So that is something you need to be able to talk about is how do we address that mental stress when the family is sick, when you're not having enough income, when you have problems uh, with a spouse or whatever. And then the last one, where are we going after the men to pay their, their full support of our children? <laughs> Thank you. You know, I just wanted to commend the person that brought up the question about sexual harassment uh, in the military. I really appreciate that. Just yesterday, I uh, was part of a female veterans symposium in Carson, and I was the luncheon speaker. And we had services there for female veterans, by, which, by the way, women veterans have the highest unemployment rate in this country. So we need to help our veterans. And she, this, a one woman came up to my table and said, Congresswoman Hahn, I hope hope you're going to mention sexual harassment because nobody's talking about it. Mm -hmm. And she's absolutely right. The fact that these women, and you know what it's like just to be leaving your family and your home for work knowing you're going to come back at the end of the day. Can you imagine uh, women who leave their children, mm -hmm. leave their families, leave their husbands, and go and serve this country in the military, and then are subject to being raped uh, and other forms of sexual abuse in the military while they're serving this country, and then if they have enough courage to even complain or file a complaint, then it goes through this chain of, the com of command, and the very officers that they report to and have to salute are the ones that sit in judgment on whether or not uh, they're telling the truth. It's absolutely one of the biggest shame that we have in this country, uh, women's sexual harassment in the military. And I am totally with uh, Senator Gillibrand. We need to take those complaints outside of the chain of command in the military <laughs> so that these women have justice. They deserve it. They're giving their lives for this country, and that's the least we can do. When you have post-traumatic syndrome, and it's not necessarily just about the war, but it's about being sexually uh, abused in the military. That is just unacceptable. And we as women, and hopefully men, a few good men, uh, will stand up. And uh, we're going to work on making sure that that happens in our lifetime. So thank okay. you for bringing and, that issue up. But, well, and, and just the last. Yeah, very, very quickly. Um, I put in a plug for Holly's bill, but I also want to put a plug in for my bill, which is the SAFE Act which would allow women who are victims of domestic violence to be able to take time off work, to go to court, to find safe place to live without the risk of losing their job. And if they lose their job as a result of sexual uh, abuse or domestic violence, they then are, would, would be eligible for unemployment benefits, which they are not oh. now. So I just wanted to throw in a plug for that. Holly. I was just going to say very quickly that, I, I, you know, that this is the women's economic agenda. And so if it were a, a, broad, a more broad-based women's agenda, there would be many more pillars. But one economic connection at the state level is human trafficking. Yeah. And that is a direct economic connection. And there are young girls, mostly, um, who have become the new commodity um, um, for, in, in, for, for gangs, um, and the predators who are marketing them. So as we talk about at the federal level, completely appropriate, at the state level, and in our community in LA County, we have an amazing, it's, it's at an epidemic proportion. And so there's legislation, there are a number of coalitions that are coming together. But in the context of a women's economic agenda, I wanted to make sure that we understand that young women are being bought and sold as commodities on our streets. And we collectively have to have space to have that conversation also. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to do one more question. This is the moderator's prerogative. I have chosen the question on STEM because I was an engineering major. Let's go Bears. Um, so what initiative can be created to end the disparity for all women in the science, technology, education, and mathematics fields? And maybe that can go to President Martinez. Okay, uh, I, I will say um, 
we have seen a change in terms of the focus on the National Science Foundation in terms of NSF grants. They are now uh, focusing in terms of Latinos, which they didn't previously. But there is a, a number of grants that are out there that many of our colleges have applied for that have emphasized more women involved and more students of color involved in these programs because we need them. Why are we going out of our countries, bringing people in who do not know our country? So this is, this is something that every community college and state colleges are working towards is to get our students more involved in science, technology, engineering, and math. Uh, currently, I am working with Cal State LA. I know that Pasadena City College and East Los Angeles College, as well as Los Angeles City College, are working on getting that pathway going. As you know, uh, Senator Padilla uh, created bills that encourage transfer pathways. And this is an area that we're working on in terms of science, technology, engineering, and math to make sure that the pathway from when our students leave a community college, they can go to a four-year college and graduate. And we're really working on making sure that they have real life experiences, that they get into research labs, they get, that they get into JPL, they, to get into different programs and different pharmaceutical programs to have real experiences so that people can see them working and know that they have the skills and will give them a job when they finish. So we are definitely working on this. Thank you. Well, that's certainly powerful. Thank you so much. I have a couple of things I have to do before we get to the call to action. I'd like to um, recognize Montebello Unified School District Superintendent Susan Contreras-Smith. And then after we hear from the uh, congressional representatives in their closing remarks, um, Mayor Pro Tem Leon would like to come back to the podium for an announcement. So with that, um, there's a call to action. Um, and you heard from Congresswoman Napolitano that you should use social media. I've been trying to write down my tweets because I couldn't actually do them in real time. But I have lots of tweeting to do after this. Um, share your stories. You know, tweet using the hashtag Women Succeed, like us on Facebook, and um, participate in the organizations that are going to be out in the uh, area with their materials so that you can um, learn more about all of the different advocacy efforts that are going on. And I know personally I've spent sent at least 50 emails um, after reading through all these materials um, over the last couple of days to women's organizations that I'm involved with. And I think I was able to engage my sorority chapter to take a look at this um, in our social action committee. So there's an opportunity out there for each one of us if we want to get involved. So with that, I'd like to ask for closing remarks from our congressional representatives, starting with Congresswoman Roy Ball Allard. Well, first of all, let me say thank you, thank you to, uh, to Kimberly for being such a great moderator. Let's give her a big round of applause. I also want to thank all the panelists for being here, uh, for those who came here to tell their personal stories. Thank you, because what you do is you put a human face on the issue, and you've provided us with, with stories and inspiration that we can take back to Washington, D.C. Muchas gracias. Um, in terms of the call to action, I think Kimberly has outlined uh, many of the things that, that we can be doing. And I, I just want to go back to the point that I made earlier. And that is about the fact that a major call to action for, is for women to become politically involved and to get out and vote. We are in an election year. And Many times people ask me, well, no, politicians don't pay attention to us anyway. Yes, we do. We know that is, it is your vote that hires us and your vote that, against us that can fire us. <laughs> and women have the power. We are, what, 50% or more of the U.S. population right now. And especially during this election year, we are, politicians are looking to see and are catering to the women's vote. So you can make a difference, as I said earlier, by becoming politically involved because 
Su voto es su voz. Your vote is your voice. And nothing speaks louder to a politician than your vote. Congresswoman Napolitano. No? Yes, there you go. Uh, and I'll add my, my I, I just want to reiterate the same remarks my colleagues have on thanking everybody for being here, the panelists and everybody else. Um, in, in checking out and in, in continuing to say what Lucille, uh, dovetailing on what her comments is, um, and again back to social media, is a look, at, look at how people are voting on the issues that are important to women. And that's something we don't do because Sacramento's over there and Washington's on the other side of the United States. But look at who is voting against women's issues, against family issues, against funding for childcare. All of those guys, wake up, because that's where you have to put the pressure, is those that are not cognizant that there's people that they're affecting. And they don't care because it becomes very political. In Washington, D.C., it's right down the middle. One side is Democrat, one side is Republican, and they, they follow politics. And until you, we start getting on that social media and making sure that you hold them accountable for the votes they're taking at the ballot box, then it won't change. So it's up to all of us to understand how we can become effective in reaching out and getting sure that making sure that we understand what you can do, what you're powerful. And as Lucille says, you have a wonderful, hard sounding voice when it comes to families. We care. And we can be very loud and very obnoxious when we want to. Let's do it. You have to be. Okay. They say that, what, what is it? They, uh, <clears throat> they say it's, uh, if it's a man, they're just outspoken. If it's a woman, it's a bitch. <laughs> Let's be more bitches. Thank you. Yeah, everybody tweet that. Let's be more bitches. And last but certain, certainly not least, one of our youngest members in Congress. <laughs> by, by seniority, not by age. By seniority, Congresswoman Hahn. Thank you, Kim. And again, thank you to all of you who came today. Thanks to all of you up here on the panel that, that uh, uh, really enlightened us on these issues. What a joy for me to serve in Congress uh, with two great women like Grace Napolitano and Lucille Royval Allard. It is just <laughs> such a thrill for me to serve with them every day. Uh, you know, when I was on the city council, I think probably the two things that I'm most proud of, uh, one was my fight to uh, make sure that the hotel workers along Century Boulevard, close to LAX, were able to receive the city's living wage, which is higher than the minimum wage, and that they were able to receive their tips. Uh, before we made it law in Los Angeles, many of the times when you thought you were adding a gratuity uh, onto your meal, particularly if you reserved one of those hotels for a banquet, that tip did not go to the people that were serving you, uh, but it went to the hotel management, and they in turn decided how much money they wanted to give back to the workers. That was now against the law in Los Angeles because of a fight that I led. And. The other thing was to make sure that 5,000 workers at LAX uh, were able to receive full family health care, and that was before Obamacare went into law. And you know why those two things made a difference? Because I got to meet those uh, housekeepers, those hotel workers. Uh, they stop me at the airport sometimes when I see the people that are, that are pushing the wheelchairs on the plane, and they thank me because you know what? They were able to quit a second job, they, which meant they were able to stay home uh, more with their kids. They were able to go to the parent-teacher conferences. They were able to have enough energy uh, to do help with homework in the evening. And so when we do these things uh, that raise the level, the quality of life uh, for these working women, uh, we are really raising the quality of life for our children, for our communities, for our city, for our state, and for our country. So this phrase is a catchy phrase, but really, when women do succeed, America will succeed. And that ought to be our, our fighting cry every day. 
And I hope when you go back today into your worlds of influence, and by the way, we all have our own sphere of influence. You influence people that I will never influence, and I have a sphere of influence that you won't influence. But together, we really can make a difference. And when you go to those candidate debates, and you sit in the audience, and you're able to submit a question to somebody running for office, take one of these pillars and ask them to comment on how they believe it makes a difference for raising the minimum wage, equal pay for equal work, and full, affordable, uh, accessible child care for every woman. Ask them how they believe on that before you give them your support or your vote. Thank you all for being here today. What a great day. <laughs>